Well, yes, we did just have a warning, but it's worth repeating. This channel, Ferris Wheelhouse, and especially this video, are not for kids. Yes, the majority of the video features classic Looney Tunes, Merry Melodies cartoons, but the historical context, some of the more racial stereotypes depicted in these dated films, as well as some of the fun had by us here on the channel, is adult in nature. Animation and puppets don't automatically mean kid-friendly, you know. So if you're a parent who's just trying to put cartoons on to sedate your little ones, this is not the video to do that with. You have been warned. What's up, Docs and Duckettes? Trevor Thompson, the self-appointed Looney Tunes critic. That's how some of you know me, and if you do, you're probably wondering, what the hell am I doing here? Uh, if you don't know me, then let me just spell it out for you. The two biggest, and in my case, that's a literal thing, too. Uh, the two biggest and best sources for all things Looney Tunes here on YouTube are now joining forces. That's right. Uh, one being this channel, 8thmandvd.com. Hello. Oh, excuse me. Hello, uh, Looney Tunes critic here uh, from the future. Um, as you can see, the uh, old me of the past has much shorter hair. And you've been watching the channel. Um, you know that uh, we are under new management up in space. Uh, Manx, Iggy, Manx and Iggy were always around, but uh, Manx's girlfriend, the bottomless fairy, Twinkle Belly. Now, um, that uh, brings me to what I paused this whole thing for. Uh, you see, uh, we shot this a while ago for the previously mentioned 8thmandvd.com. Uh, we never signed any papers, but uh, this was kind of like a friendly deal. <sighs> and, and then he ghosted, <laughs> then he ghosted us. That's, why, that's what all this talk about, uh, you know, me. It's weird that I'm here. It's not weird that I'm here. It's weird that I'm here and he's back over there. Sure. But um, so I was... Uh, getting ready, I was I was done with this project, and it was pretty much sitting on a shelf. And uh, and then Twinkle Belly, uh, who is now the editor of all my videos, she wanted to repurpose the video, and I didn't. So she came down to earth here, here in my humblest of abodes, to try and convince me to let her finish editing it and put it out. At one point, she shaved me, and I don't know what really happened there. But anyway, I was done with Eighth Man, and I was not prepared to listen to Twink or her attempts uh, to convince me. Uh, but uh, she was very convincing. Actually, speaking of repurposing, um, one part of the video here at the very beginning that I'm going to keep, and I do want you guys to see... Um, it's a uh, part where I have to kind of acknowledge the fact that uh, my copies of the cartoons look great and Eighth Man's look like shit. And also the best versions Warner Brothers ever made. Some people have complained in the past that Eighth Man tends to present the cartoons in a fashion that those of us in the film preservation world tend to cringe at. But look at those numbers, man. Everybody's watching. Meanwhile, even with my small little numbers, the one compliment that I get all the time is that I have the best versions of the cartoons available. So, for the most part, that is true. So yeah, there are multiple Eighth Man mentions in this video, and any time that we uh, have some stuff with the Eighth Man mentions, uh, we will be cutting to something else. We will be cutting to uh, Twinkle Belly and the denizens of the Sour Mash, uh, Manx and Iggy, dancing to the Ferris Wheelhouse Chair, which goes a little something like this. Actually, it goes exactly like that, but uh, it's longer. And uh, so every time I mention in this video uh, the Eighth Man stuff, uh, uh, you know, just to get around it, uh, we will be cutting to the Ferris Wheelhouse chair. So that's uh, that's what I need to let you guys know in order for this video to proceed. And uh, I will take you back to the regularly scheduled uh, cartoon compilation. 
I put them all in chronological order because if we're to learn anything about this studio and the wonderful artists who work there and created these beloved characters, watching the cartoons in order is the way to go. So, let's start where it all began because at this point we really have no other choice. It's uh, Bosco, the Talk Inc. Kid from 1929. Now, some people know, or at least have a cursory understanding of who Bugs Bunny's fathers are, especially if they've seen this, the first theatrical fiction Looney Tunes film directed by Chuck Jones. In the Bugs Bunny Roadrunner movie, Bugs is seen narrating his life in his home, and at one time mentions these great men. Now, the first theatrical non-fiction Looney Tunes film, Bugs Bunny Superstar, was hosted by Bob Clampett, who directed many of Bugs' pre-1946 cartoons, and since the cartoons featured in this video span from 29 to 43, you'll be seeing a lot of his stuff here. But due to a lifelong and often misunderstood feud between Jones and Clampett, he's not featured in Bugs' wall of many fathers. Now, while the father featured here, animator and director, and as we'll soon see, failed actor Rudy Ising, is one of two fathers that started the studio that led to these great cartoons, he and his partner Hugh Harmon had long left before Bugs came around, so them not being included in either film is not a mistake or a snub. The way it all started was this thing, Bosco the Talking Kid. It never aired. Actually, aired is um, misleading terminology, aired. That means it actually went out on TV, and this was well before TV. This is 1929, although it was certainly featured in uh, Toon Heads, The Lost Cartoons, on Cartoon Network, uh, back when Cartoon Network actually used to play cartoons. <laughs> Sorry, don't mind me, I'm old. I, uh, I just sound it, you know. It's, I wonder though, is that gonna become a thing? Remember in the early to late 2000s, they would, people, you'd hear people bitching about MTV, like, oh, remember, MTV doesn't play music videos anymore. Is that gonna become a thing too, about Cartoon Network? Oh, Cartoon Network doesn't play cartoons anymore. Is that gonna become a thing? Really? God, I hope so. The point is, this never saw the light of day. Every cartoon you're gonna see in this video, minus this one, at one point was aired, however. We all know these cartoons growing up watching TV, but they all premiered on the big screen. And this is why the old cartoons are always better, because movies were the prestige, expensive productions, and TV are the cheap and quick productions, and it's no different in animation, at least in those days. And in 1929, animation was pretty new and two young animators, inspired by a certain Mr. Disney, and later working with an animator who moved from Kansas City with Walt Disney to California, that of Frizz Freeling, made a quick short with their character Bosco to show to a producer of westerns, Leon Schlesinger, that they could make their own studio. Now, while it should be said for the record that the Bosco that we all know and love, from Looney Tunes on Nickelodeon, the DVDs, and maybe even that one episode of Tiny Tunes that we all remember, uh, the character is very much still in its infancy here. Uh, what he became was kind of an anthropomorphized monkey with a Mickey Mouse voice, but here, I'm just going to say it, he's a black boy. So, if racial stereotypes in these early cartoons offend you, that's completely understandable. This is the time code to go to if you want to bypass this cartoon entirely. Understandable. When Warner Brothers releases these things on DVD, it's always with a disclaimer that basically states that while we all know these stereotypes are cruel and wrong, to not acknowledge them and simply not include them is the same as pretending that they never happened. That's basically my feeling too. And it's not just African Americans, the character of Bosco himself actually portrays a Japanese character with about the same level of racial insensitivity as you would expect. All you can really say is... It was a different time. And the times do change during the studio's development, which is something else you'll experience watching these chronologically here with me. So, let's get it started. This is uh, from 1929. It's the pitch animation that led to everything else. Bosco, the Talk Inc. Kid.
is, and I sure feel good. Oh, you feel good, do you? Yeah, I'm just out of the pen. <laughs> All right, now that you're here, what can you do? What can I do? Oh, uh -uh, boy, what I can't do ain't. Well, well, who are you? Who is I? I'm Bosco. That's who I ain't nobody else except but. Bosco, eh? All right, Bosco. Show me what you can do. Okay, boss. What's this here? Who's all them folks out there in the dark? Why, the audience, Bosco. Can you make them laugh? Bosco, the talking kid from 1929. And that last line where he says, Well, so long, folks. See y'all later. Would later get shortened in future cartoons to So Long, Folks, which, of course, would eventually become the now iconic That's All, Folks. And that is going to be all for 1929 and on to 1930, wherein Leon Schlesinger is now partnered up with Harmonizing, probably the first of many pun-based enterprises to exist in animation. Think about it. Harmonizing? It's beautiful. And 1930 brought us many cartoons. Uh, among them, the ones that we're going to look at today were Congo Jazz, The Booze Hangs High, and Sinking in the Bathtub, a cartoon which bears the distinction of being not just an instructional video I give to all my girlfriends as to how to properly answer the door. Trevor! But also being the very first Looney Tune. The very first Merry Melody was Lady Play Your Mandolin. 
and uh, that's right, there is a difference between Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies, and even that took a little while to work out. Again, this is evolution, folks. It takes a while. Now, there's very little difference today, and usually the words Looney Tunes or Merry Melodies are just that. Words. Empty words! That's all they are! And the further away you got from the early days, the less meaning those words had. For example, there's a few standalone cartoons made in the 80s for promotional things, TV specials and such, and they happen to be Merry Melodies simply because the only piece of footage of the color rings from something that recent that they could use in the, for the syndicated version of it was also dubbed a Merry Melody, again, arbitrarily. In fact, the movie Bugs Bunny's 1001 Rabbit Tales is technically a Merry Melody because... At the end, just before the credits roll, they show a That's All Folks color rings from some old cartoon, and that one happened to be Mary Melody. So, again, arbitrary. However, in these early days, there was a clear difference between a Looney Tune and a Mary Melody, and in Foxy's case, there were even characters that were relegated strictly to one or the other. But yeah, the gist of it is that Looney Tunes were the cheaper cartoons, mainly done in black and white in the early days, and Mary Melodies were the color cartoons that had a budget and that usually feature a song and title from the Warner Brothers music library. Basically, they were the first music videos. The thing is, it being the first Looney Tune, Bathtub was produced before this distinction was made. And while Congo and Booze certainly do feature music, it's still the early days. By the way, there isn't a single classically animated cartoon made before the 60s where music isn't inherent to the production, if not the driving force. Every millisecond of every soundtrack is locked to the same beats and timings that the director has selected. But that practice wouldn't exist if it weren't for composers. Indeed, the timing sheets are based on musical bar sheets, the timing sheets that animators use. But Frizz Freeling had such a musical influence, he actually didn't use the timing sheets, but actual musical bar paper. Which is probably why his cartoons have some of the best timing. Anyway, speaking of timing, I've overstayed my welcome, so now, representing music and the innovation of 1930, here is Congo Jazz sinking in the bathtub and the booze hangs high, all starring Bosco. The one we know and love, by the way. The real one. Enjoy.
What's up, docs and docettes? Trevor Thompson, the self-appointed Looney Tunes critic here, and if you like old cartoons and watching online reviewers dissect them, then you probably said the same thing I did about two years ago. Hey, what the fuck? Bear, watch your language, you bud. Every Saturday morning, I do a brand new commentary of a Warner Brothers short. All throughout the month, I do video essays examining the history of these cartoons. And now, here's Eric Bowser, the new voice of Bugs Bunny. <laughs> You've been listening to the Looney Tunes critic. Ain't he a stinker? <laughs>
That's 1930 for you, docs and docettes. I'm Trevor Thompson, the self-appointed Looney Tunes critic, and uh, I do this kind of thing for you all true to video. So uh, that's uh, we're on to 1931 now, and uh, you may remember last time we talked that uh, Lady Play Your Mandolin uh, was the first Merry Melody. But uh, I also mentioned uh, a character called Foxy very briefly, and uh, what uh, what a lot of people don't people don't really know Foxy, and I think that's because he really was only he only had three cartoons. Foxy was the main character in the aforementioned Mandolin, a cartoon I'm about to show you called Smile Darn Ya Smile, and the ironically titled One More Time. I say ironically titled because it was the last attempt to make this character stick with the general public. As if to say, this character's got nothing, no more cartoons. Oh, come on, let's give him another. Oh, fine, one more time, but you'll see, he's got nothing. And indeed, as One More Time proved, nothing was all he got. Nothing more, anyway. Now, the title, Smile Darn Ya Smile, probably has more resonance today, if any, with fans of Who Framed Roger Rabbit than with the actual song that the cartoon is based on. Remember, A Merry Melody, which Darn Ya is, is based on a song, and that's certainly the case here. And yes, it is the same song in Roger Rabbit. In this great monument to classic theatrical animation, tunes are depicted next to humans in the real world. In fact, the practice of using the term tunes to describe cartoon characters came from this movie. And while we see them in the real world, they also live in Toontown. And twice in the film, this animated city sings Smile Darn Ya Smile in unison and with a kind of gusto that only animation can warrant. The point is, even though nobody remembers Foxy, this cartoon is memorable enough that they used Smile Darn Ya Smile in Who Framed Roger Rabbit twice. They wouldn't have used it at all if it wasn't instantly recognizable as cartoon music. Iconic, you know, in the zeitgeist as it were. Speaking of characters that didn't exist beyond three shorts, I give you Piggy. Well, the truth is, Piggy had a longer life than Foxy, in as much as he's featured more in the end titles. In fact, real quick, here's an edit of every one of Piggy's end title appearances. Was that not everything and just a wee bit more? I don't care. Uh, we're going to spend our time now in 1931 uh, with these forgotten, now forgotten characters, Foxy and Piggy. Uh, in their, uh, their two of their cartoons, probably the best ones that they did. You know, then again, they have a very short filmography. 
Um, Foxy and Piggy. This is the Foxy and Piggy show here in 1931. You're watching the best cartoons of all time with me, your host, Trevor Thompson, the self-appointed Looney Tunes critic, right here on 8th. Ferris wheel house, Ferris wheel house, la, 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 la. And now you're going to watch Smile, Darn Your Smile, and you don't know what you're doing. At least I hope you are. Stick around.
Antonio Boy.
What's up, Docs and Docettes? Trevor Thompson, the self-appointed Looney Tunes critic here, and together we're watching on 8th Wheelhouse some of the greatest animated cartoons ever made at Warner's, and uh, we're right in the middle of 1930, uh, 1932 excuse me, uh, at the moment, and uh, we're representing Mary Melodies pretty well with these next two cartoons, um, both named after popular songs of the day, which are also um, featured in the cartoon as well. That's a major characteristic of Mary Melodies back then. So... Let's now look at I Love a Parade, and it's got me again. Uh, two cartoons which don't feature any of the major characters that we know and love from the studio, but the latter of the two, it's got me again. Uh, that cartoon was the first time uh, the studio was anything that the studio did was nominated for an Academy Award. Me, an Academy Award winning cartoon short. So, oh, and uh, both of these were uh, directed by Rudy Ising as well. So, here they are now. I love a parade, and it's got me again from 1932. Enjoy.
wrong, folks! Merry Melodies would one day become the series that would be in color exclusively. And one of the first ones to have color was the cartoon that not only introduced the first character of any staying power, that of Porky Pig, but also a slew of characters. By the time they'd gotten to that cartoon, named I Haven't Got a Hat, the studio was finally sophisticated enough to try this new thing that Disney's had been doing, personality animation. And as such, they needed some fresh personalities to try it out on. What's up, ducks and docettes? I'm Trevor Thompson, the self-appointed Looney Tunes critic. This is what I do, man. This is what I do, baby. I inform the world of the history and making of all things Looney Tunes, the commentaries of the old shorts, review specials, movies, and tropes of the classic characters, and sometimes I even interview guests that were lucky enough to work on this stuff. So for more of that kind of thing, be sure to subscribe to my channel, Ferris Wheelhouse. And uh, anyway, more about I Haven't Got a Hat, if I may. And you don't know me, I just may. So, that animator I told you about at the beginning, Frizz Freeling? Well, first of all, his real name wasn't Frizz, because like many animated cartoonists, he has a silly nickname because his real name was far too sophisticated for the likes of a cartoon studio. So, Isadora Freeling created Porky as part of a duo, Porky and Beans. This was definitely Freeling's cartoon. He directed the short, and part of its goal was to give them more characters to play with. By having the first cartoon be a classroom setting, it gave an excuse to have a number of characters in one place. While Porky is the only character from the short to become anything, he and Beans were designed as a duo, but they did more apart than together. They certainly did make cartoons where Porky and Beans were featured side by side, but the point of Hat was to introduce the characters together and then have shorts starring them alone. The cartoon we're about to look at, and the one that's representing all of 1935 in this video, is a Bean's favorite, Hollywood Capers. And as I say, the only cartoon from 35 that we're watching today might actually be the first time where the premise of a character trying to get into a Hollywood studio was first attempted. At least, in animation. Also, you'll notice that they were trying, clearly in this cartoon with Beans, to utilize a catchphrase that, much like the character himself, didn't take. The catchphrase in question is this. Beans is the name! Part of the Boston Beans! And he says it, well, I don't know how many times, but enough that it's stuck in my head all these years later. I don't know exactly what it is, because when I googled Boston Beans, I just got the literal thing. Boston Beans. Now a good guess as to what this could be is that there was once in the days of early sound comedies an old trope where in particular old money families are associated with certain cities, usually in the east, and um, they usually have moments in them where common folk characters poke fun at this tradition. So, in other words, if I were in a scene and I said my name is Thompson and the butler goes, Oh, of the Philadelphia Thompsons, as if to go, you know, who are you, buddy? Nobody cares. Who do you think you are? Ergo Beans, a character depicted to be of common stock, identifying as uh, one of the Boston Beans falls into that old saw, which quite possibly predates vaudeville. Anyway, if Beans doesn't come from money, he's certainly trying to make some. You gotta give it to him. He gave it the old college try. Uh, staking his claim for fame by trying to sneak into a movie studio. It's 1935's Hollywood Capers. Who 
do you think you are? Beans is the name. One of the Boston beans. <laughs>
What's up, ducks and duckettes? Trevor Thompson, the self-appointed Looney Tunes critic here, and we are watching some great cartoons. But uh, from here on out, everybody, it's only the main Looney Tunes Mary Melodies characters that time has remembered. No more of these weird monkey characters that are also racial stereotypes. No more side characters that don't go anywhere. And no one who works only as a tool to say goodbye with. Here's the studio's first real star, representing our single entry into Schlesinger Studios in 1937. It's everyone's favorite pantless poor sign in, Porky's Railroad. Hey, what was you got? What's up, folks? You're listening to the uh, 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 Trevor Thompson, the uh, 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 self-appointed uh, 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 Looney Tunes critic. Although, uh, everyone's a critic. Uh, 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 that's all, folks. <laughs> Pardon me, uh, m m Mrs. Cow. Will you uh, c uh, kindly get off the t t t track? Uh, come on, uh, c uh, c come on, uh, get going. Uh, t t t time's wasting. I'm scrapping you, m m m mess of t t t t bones. Give milk a, a, a bad name. I uh, bet she can't give a sweet milk with a, a sour puss like that. So you won't walk, eh? I'll sh show you, you f four legged piece of hamburger. <laughs>
Next hurts, old gal. Parting is s s such sweet s s sorrow. I w w wish you lots of uh, l l luck, Mr. S s s s Silverfish. Say, what is that? A percolator on a roller skate? <laughs> I'll b b b b bet my uh, t Tootsie can uh, b b be his old uh, s -s 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 Silverfish. Oh, yeah? It's a bet. We'll have a race and see. Wasn't that something? That was Porky's Railroad, directed by Frank Tashlin, a director who is not uh, depicted in this painting of uh, the classic uh, Warner Brothers Looney Tunes directors, and uh, who's also not featured in Bugs Bunny's Wall of Fathers in the Bugs Bunny Roadrunner movie, but who, by all accounts, should be. And the early days that this short was made were a time before we were all sort of indoctrinated to think that all animation was for kids, because... Tashlin was through and through a comedy director. He just so happened to start in animation and then progress to movies in a time before the likes of the South Park guys or Mike Judge and even Terry Gilliam, for that matter. We're going to keep on with Tashlin because he's one of my all-time favorites, not just as a cartoon director at Warner's, but also just a director in general. I love, I love a lot of his live action movies. In fact, I think the only Bob Hope movies I like are directed by Frank Tashlin. But, uh, so he's one of my all time favorites. And yet I have friends who consider themselves to be diehard Looney Tunes fans who have no idea who he is. They knew his cartoons, but it really wasn't until the early two thousands and the release of these babies over here, the Looney Tunes golden collection, that Tashlin got his due in the public mind's eye. It was at this time that animation blogs were very vibrant and flourishing, as well as the bonus features of these DVD sets giving Tashlin his due. In fact, there's a great documentary about him in Volume 3 of uh, The Golden Collection. It's called Tish Tash, The Animated World of Frank Tashlin. And uh, on Volume 4, you can see his storybooks uh, that he wrote for kids. I mean, the man was a storyteller through and through, no matter the age or the medium. And uh, as we're praising the Golden Collection discs, moving right down to Volume 5 is a great documentary about a lot of the directors that, we've, that I've mentioned thus far. The unknown guys who directed these unknown shorts that we've already been watching. Uh, it's on Disc 4, Volume 5, actually, and it's called Unsung Maestros, a Director's Tribute. Now, whether Tashlin is on that thing or not, I don't recall. Probably not, though, because, as I say, by this time he was more well-known. Plus, he had his own documentary two sets ago. But, at any rate, an unsung maestro, Frank Tashlin most certainly was. This dude did it all, man. Funny drawings, funny gags, good staging, funny timing. Everything that we now attribute to the best and most well-known cartoons and directors of said cartoons. But, 
What he had that the others didn't was an overt desire to push the limits of what you could do cinematically in a medium where the camera never moves. Think about it. The camera in animation is locked down from the ceiling pointing directly at a table. It never moves. If you want the background to move, you have to make the drawing itself move, or make drawings of movement, really. A camera for a movie can move wherever you put it, and making the background move isn't something you have to do. It moves when the camera moves. So to simulate that kind of thing, when the actual camera you're shooting with doesn't move itself, it, things can be quite tricky, even today simulating movement. Now, this is what Tashlin would eventually become known for. Successful attempts to bring the grammar of cinema to animation, and it's partially because of the work, but also because he left Schlesinger's to become a filmmaker, or, as they no doubt would have said back in the day, a real director. But even as a fake director, he was one of the best. The cartoon of Tashlin's that I'm going to show you next is our only entry into 1938, but it's a lot of fun. It's a cartoon called Have You Got Any Castles, another merry melody named for a song. And it's one of about five cartoons that became a trope in the late 30s and early 40s, that of the illustrations of book covers coming to life and singing. And the first one of its kind was from 1933, called I Like Mountain Music. And the last one, and the one that did it best in my opinion, was Bob Clampett's Book Review. Now, I should say, just for the record, that this cartoon does get censored a lot on TV, and it is, again, for racial stereotypes, particularly the caricatures of uh, Bill Robinson and Cad Calloway. So, if you want to bypass this cartoon because of all that, understandable. Here is the time code to, uh, to jump to and avoid the cartoon. And uh, so now, without any further ado, here is Frank Tashlin from 1938. Frank Tashlin's Have You Got Any Castles? Tell it makes you mop your forehead. I've got swing for sale. 
rims What this country needs For years and years I've said it If you buy from me, it's COD I sell swing but not for credit Boom, 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 boom with the memories of the bookland frolic. All is well. All is well. Wasn't that wovey? Wasn't that wovey? Uh, what's up, dogs and dog cats? It's Trevor Thompson, the self appointed Looney Tunes critic. And uh, we're enjoying some of the best cartoons made at Warner Brothers in the early days. And uh, we just got through uh, 1938 
with uh, Frank Tashlin's Have You Got Any Castles? And uh, this next one is going to be another sole entry for an entire year, that of 1939, and it's Daffy Duck and the Dinosaur. This cartoon is quite a breakthrough for director Chuck Jones, as it's one of his first funny ones. He hadn't been a director long, and when he first started, he had an overt desire, as many did, to copy Disney, or at least what he thought Disney was doing, which, in Chuck's case, was cutesy and sentimental stuff. Other cavemen get to go swimming, but I never get to do anything. Anyway, there's a lot to discuss about this cartoon, such as the fact that the caveman here is an impression of Jack Benny, which is ironic considering that Mel Blanc, who is voicing Daffy, worked on the Jack Benny program and considered Benny to be his dearest friend. But yes, a lot to discuss, and why do it here? Why not just watch the cartoon? If you would like to watch the cartoon with my running commentary, click up there to watch that. And then come back here and you can watch the cartoon itself. Or do it in reverse order, I don't care. Or, instead of all that, you could watch my review of Looney Tunes World of Mayhem. What does that have to do with anything, you ask? Well, in that review, Mel Blanc and Jack Benny's loving friendship was brought up during my interview with Eric Bauza, who voices Bugs in the game. And at the time of the interview, he was recording Bugs for Looney Tunes cartoons on HBO Max. These two projects are the first jobs that Bowser has had as the rabbit, and in my interview he cites one of my first videos, which discusses occasions where Blank voiced the Looney Tunes characters for stuff that wasn't made by Warner Brothers. Here's a look at the part where I mentioned Jack Benny and his friendship with Mel. All throughout Mel's radio and cartoon career, he maintained a close personal friendship with Jack Benny. These two comedy icons were such good friends that very often they would break each other up. Jack never broke except when he was with Mel. And Mel never broke, except when Jack would change the script on him. Hey, uh, what are you doing now? <laughs> I'm the voice of Bucks Bundy. <laughs> one of the best examples of Mel doing one of the Looney Tunes voices on radio away from Warner Brothers is on the Jack Benny program. Uh, tell me, mister, did you always think you were a rabbit? Uh, no, no, up until last week I thought I was a turkey. <laughs> Up until last week, yeah? What made you stop being a turkey? Well, it's so close to Thanksgiving, they turned me down for life insurance. <laughs> oh. I want a double indemnity. I see. With cranberry sauce. That's the only way to have it. Bowser said that that clip of blank as bugs that I found on the Jack Benny program motivated his bugs. And Trevor, I got to credit you. I mean, you 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 found this clip of uh, Mel Blanc on the Jack Benny program, uh, yeah. doing that sketch where he's he's at the psychiatrist's office. Yeah, I will tell you, like that's one of my favorite things to listen to uh, on my drive into work for Looney Tunes as reference. So, for more on Mel Blanc's friendship with Jack Benny, you can watch that video, or you can check out my commentary of this cartoon to learn more. Hey man, not trying to tell you how to live your life, I'm just saying you got options is all. Uh, anyway, here's Jack Benny Caveman, Daffy Duck, and a dinosaur named Fido, who quite frankly deserves more screen time. Maybe they'll add him to uh, Looney Tunes World of Mayhem, who knows. It's Daffy Duck and the Dinosaur from 1939. Enjoy. Hungry. 
I could eat a saber-toothed tiger. Well, anyway, half a one. Well, this isn't getting me breakfast. Here, Fido. Well, the eggs. Now, come on, I'm famished. Bet you're cranky before breakfast, too. Be quiet! Mm. Yum, yummy. My favorite vegetable, duck. like he's crazy. That is correct. Absolutely 100% correct. So that's the way it is, eh? All right, then. Fine thing. No swimming. Other cavemen get to go swimming, but I never get to do anything. Well, what are you looking at? Don't just stand there. Do something. Now go get it. The big lummox. <laughs> well, now isn't that clever? The hunter's helper. <laughs> now come on. Not bad for a guy that never took a lesson in his life. <laughs> Wait here. what I wanted, a duck breakfast. Gee, I can hardly wait. Come on, Fido. Thank you.
Bill's there. such a hot idea after all. Good night, folks. What's up, Docs and Docats? Welcome back. I'm Trevor Thompson, the self-appointed Looney Tunes critic. And uh, I gotta tell you, we're moving on. Uh, we're moving on in terms of not just the year, but also the popular characters. Daffy and Porky were teamed up a lot, and uh, that's a tradition that carries on even to this day with uh, Looney Tunes cartoons. But they were both in their early stages at this point, and as indeed the studio itself was. So, what you're going to see now, all from 1941, are three Porky cartoons, where he's utilized in three very different ways by three very different directors. Did I say three? I meant two. Sort of. So the first director is Tex Avery, and his cartoon, Porky's Preview, about Porky showing his animated cartoon to a farm of critters to less than enthusiastic response, is... Probably a slice of life for Avery. Indeed, this was his life even before the cartoons went out to the general public, as his bosses had to watch the cartoons for approval. Now, the other director, whom I'm referring to as Two in this instance, is Bob Clampett, by way of Chuck Jones. You see, Clampett directed another cartoon this year, with Porky in a theater, but in his, Porky is simply a newsreel reader, and the cartoon itself is a joke about the way theaters were run in those days. But the other cartoon we're going to watch also by Clampett, was later completely remade after he left the studio by Chuck Jones. That's right, Little Orphan Airedale is basically what a Bob Clampett cartoon looks like directed by Chuck Jones, and doubtless Jones, at the height of his disgust with Clampett at this time, would have thought all of Clampett's cartoons would have been improved if he'd remade them himself. The one thing that's far more innovative in Clampett's version than in Jones's Airedale is something that Clampett had done in some earlier cartoons and would later do the inclusion of photographed live-action backgrounds. Remember, the Looney Tunes, which Pooch was, were, unlike the Merry Melodies, the cheaper cartoons, and this was a creative way to cut corners with photographing the backgrounds rather than having to paint stuff. Would the cheaper TV animation studios just a few decades later could have been so thoughtful? So yeah, let's watch these three greats from 1941, but before we do that, if you'd like to see more Looney Tunes Merry Melodies uh, comprehensive content, you should subscribe. We do it all at Ferris Wheelhouse, man. Reviews, think pieces, commentaries, regular series about directors and animators, even remixes and fan servicey stuff like compilation edits of some of the hardest to find prints of these classic Warner Brothers cartoons. So yeah, let's get back to it. Here's a good slab of ham for you from 1941. It's Porky's Pooch, Porky's Preview, and meet John Doughboy.
boy, oh boy, what's a good white? What's jumping? How's every little team? Not very good, laddie. I'm in a streak of hard luck. Say, Hootman, what are you doing in that grand car? I belong in it. I got myself a master now, see? Three square meals a day. No more bumming around the streets for me. All I gotta do is wag my tail and make out I'm glad to see him when he comes home. Then it's nice doggy this and nice doggy that. That's a cinch. That sounds very good. But how did you manage to put it over in the first place? Well, one day I determines to get me a master. So I goes to a ritzy district, way over on Park Avenue, where all of them swell penthouses is, through the fancy entrance, up to the top floor of a classy apartment house, and I rings at one of the doors. Shucks, who in the wicked world can that be? Every time I get in the, t- the tub, that darn bell rings. <laughs> it, 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 it never fails. <laughs> Hello, bub. Hey, I got a preposition for you. Look, you ain't got no dog, and I ain't got no master. What do you say we gets together? You know, let's moige. Yeah, try me for size. And I'm affectionate, too. Mm-hmm. Where are we going? Bye-bye? I'm uh, s- sorry, but, but, but I don't want a dog. Well, uh, the, uh, that's that. tricks to, you know, sit up, roll over, even play dead. Hey, watch me make like rigor mortis. And I'm very affectionate, too. Life without love, love without you, that does it. This is the end. <laughs> Goodbye, cruel world. Now, 
Let's play the song. Let's play the song. Oh, puppy, speak to me. Good old doggy, nice puppy. Oh, you, you, the poor thing. Gosh, I didn't know you cared. I'm a bad boy. That's awful. Let's see. There ought to be some way of getting into this joint. Uh oh. Hiya, gang. And now, if you'll all be quiet, we'll start the show. I, uh, <laughs> I, I drew this cartoon all by, by, by myself, but, uh, shucks, it wasn't hard, because I'm an artist. <laughs> uh, I, I hope you like it. <laughs> yeah, thank you.
What's up, folks? You're listening to it to be it to be the Trevor Thompson, it is to be the self-appointed it will be the Looney Tunes critic. Although uh, everyone's a critic, it will be it will be that's all, folks. Some uh, sli- 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 sensational movies, and they're just chock full of uh, mini- 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 military secrets. So, if there's any uh, th- a fifth columnist in the audience, uh, will they uh, b- 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 please leave the th- th- theater right now? Uh, th- uh, thank you. America's defense effort. As the tenseness of the world situation mounts by the hour, more and more important in the defense plan looms our vital industries. Fast furnaces at white heat convert the iron ore into defense implements. Here we see the molten metal automatically conveyed and about to be poured. This is the stuff from which tanks are made. In modern blitz warfare, air power is often the deciding factor. And the need for all types of planes has every American aircraft factory humming. (laughs) Because of their proven effectiveness, various types of British RAF planes are studied and improved upon. In front of us is one of the famous English Spitfires. With the machinery and materials approaching peak output, the need for men to man these machines grows urgent. Then came the drafts. X-ray, X-ray, read all about the draft bill. Citizen Sugarcane says, Our open-door policy is responsible for the draft. All over the country, men of draft age scan their draft board lists for their number and discuss their chances of being called up. Tell you we ain't got nothing to worry about. We both got high numbers. 
Your number's even higher than mine. And besides, you're much too short. They'd never take a little runt like you. You and your education. Draftees are housed in well-planned modern army camps. Because of the outdoor life and regular hours, the boys develop hearty appetites and are fed plenty of good, wholesome food. Because, as the great General Napoleon once said, an army travels on its stomach. The army is rapidly being equipped with all types of armament, from the huge siege guns down to the machine gun nest. Even in a modern mechanized army, the horse still has a place. Here are some army horses raised in South America. La conga! <laughs> Our new anti-tank gun is the answer to any possible tank attack. Here is one about to blast a robot tank. Here it comes. Watch the tremendous hitting power of this super gun. The tank is almost in the direct line of fire. Get ready. Aim. Fire! 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 What's the matter? Why don't they shoot? What are those gunners doing? <laughs> Mine's longer than yours. Here we see the latest long-range rapid-fire coast defense gun in action. Shooting 10 million shells a second. Watch. <laughs> government policy, new machines are constantly being developed. Here is the latest weapon, a land destroyer, 100 times faster and more effective than a tank. Look at that thing go, hurtling through space at five miles a minute. Hey, stop and let us see that machine. Hello again, folks. Hold on to your bridge work, boss. Here we go again. Thanks. The president orders all-out test of defense strength. The mighty armed forces of the nation respond to the president's command. Fortresses, pursuit ships, long-range bombers. And on the sea, our mighty Navy tries out its powerful guns. On land, our tank corps drives forward to the scene of action. Are we safe from air attack? Supposing one day a fleet of enemy bombers suddenly appeared over the horizon. Where are our defenses? Why isn't something being done? That's all, folks. <laughs> Uh, hey, sorry, um, thought I had more time. Um, you know what? Watch Farm Frolics, it's from 1941. Go on, give us some privacy. Suckle vine, where the honeysuckle vine finds itself around the door. A 
sweetheart mine, sweetheart mine is waiting patiently for me. So please come back to sight. The typical American farm presents many interesting sights. This show horse is the pride of the farm and the winner of many blue ribbons. He is trained to perform in every gate. First, let's see you do a trot. Now the gallop. That's fine. Now do a canter. I'm happy about the whole thing. The way that you walk, the way that you talk. Hey, hey. That's enough of that. Here we find the farmer's faithful old watchdog. Though he is no longer very active, he still does a few little odd jobs around the house. One of his chores is to fetch the newspaper. Oh, there's the paper now. I can hardly wait to see what happened to Dick Tracy. Here is a group of cute little piggies playing in the mud. Well, what are they up to? They seem fascinated by that clock. Oh, well. Here's a proud mother hen, carefully watching over her eggs, anxiously awaiting the eventful day. What a happy little family this will be. What's this? A weasel, the ruthless thief of the barnyard, watching his chance to sneak in and steal those defenseless little eggs. He draws closer and closer and closer. we find many species of bird life. The birds always... Oh, look up there. No, no, over to the left. See? A little owl nestling inside the tree trunk. Here's an interesting sight. A young couple laboriously building their nest with a bit of string from here and a piece of straw from there. A little twig, a bit of string, piece of straw, a little twig, a bit of string, piece of straw, a little twig, bit of string, piece of straw, a little twig, string, straw, twig, string, straw, twig, string, twig, string, twig, string, twig. At the edge of the woods, field mice make their home. Here we see one of the most common types. Say, he seems to be a bit worried. Tell me, little fellow, what seems to be troubling you? I don't know, Doc. I... I just keep hearing things. Even the tiniest of insects, such as the ants, have a language all their own. Emerging from the opening comes a female of the species. If you listen very closely, you can hear her calling to her young. Henry! Coming, mother! The modern farm is conducted on a business like... Well, here are those little piggies again. Say, piggies, why don't you go off and play? Well, suit yourself. 
Here is one of the strangest friendships that has ever been known. Natural enemies, yet living together as friends. A cat and a mouse. Tell me, is it true that the cat takes good care of you? And keeps you nice and warm? Well, that's truly a friendship. Now, before we leave you, is there anything that you would like to say to your friends in the audience? Get me out of here! <laughs> And so, as the day draws to a close, and the sun sinks slowly in the west, we reluctantly take our leave of the farm. Well, the piggies again. Are they going to stay there all night? What in the world can the attraction be? Freddy Cat, this is only a tiny little bird. You mean a poor little dinsy wincy itsy bitsy defenseless boy? Yes. Let me at him! Let me at him! I'll get him, baby! Get away! I'll moralize him! Let me at him! Take it easy! Take I'll it show easy! Him. Why is he getting any stuff? Don't hold me back! I'll get him! I'll show him! Come on, quit your fooling. Don't get up that ladder. Push me, Abbott! Don't come push on, me! Come on, I'm scared to go up high. I get hydrophobia. No, oh, I don't want to come go. On. Oh, don't push me. Oh, come don't. On. You can't make me do it. You can't make me do it. <laughs> he do it. Come on, stupid. Get the bird. Oh. Give me the bird. Give me the bird. If the haze office would only let me, I'd give him the point, all right. Everything's under control. Don't push me down in a box, Babbitt. Please don't do it. Don't do it. Hey, Babbitt. Oh, Babbitt. Babbitt. What's the matter now? I'm afraid of the dark. Well, I'll let you out then. I thought I tore a pretty tap. I did. I tore a pretty tap. Oh, 
no good. Oh, the brakes were against you. I'm a flopperoo. I can't even get the boy. Don't worry. You'll get it all right. You mean I'll get it in the end? Yeah, and you'll get a big bang out of it, too. Well, that sure takes a load off of my mind. What's the matter with you? Aren't you ashamed? I don't know. Why do you do these things? I'm a bad pussycat. Oh, I just can't seem to get the boy. Ain't no use. Don't worry. I can't do it. This'll get you up there. Contact. 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 What's up, Docs and Docettes? Trevor Thompson, the self-appointed Looney Tunes critic here. We've been going through the years, starting with the production of the first piece of animation that led to the studio forming in 1929, and now, with that last cartoon, A Tale of Two Kitties, which is basically an Abbott and Costello cartoon, we've crossed the border into 1942 territory! Yeah! I wish I had a whip, I don't uh, But we're going to spend some time with 42, and even more with 43, so... Get comfy, because the party's just getting started. So we're going to start 42 off with another Bob Clampett great, that of Eaton on the Cuff, or the moth who came to dinner. And pay attention to the backgrounds, because once again, Clampett employs the cost-cutting method of using photographs instead of paintings for the backgrounds. Although, in this case, it does make a little more sense stylistically, because the, uh, the narrator, the guy we see on the piano, is a live actor. This man is a then-working actor named Leo White, uncredited in this role, and sadly, there were a lot of roles in his career that went uncredited. In fact, while he is credited on IMDb, the only reason I know he was in Casablanca, seen here, is because I just happened to be watching the movie one day on the big screen, and he caught my eye. I thought, there's no way that's the guy from the Moth cartoon, is it? So I looked it up on IMDb later, and indeed it was. And old Leo's got the chops, but he's also got Mel Blanc's voice. One of the most American voices of all time. An interesting prospect for a British actor like White. See, for many decades, if you're going to use photographs as a background, it's 
mainly a cost-cutting method. It's, it's very seldom a style choice, but that doesn't mean that the audience necessarily has to feel that. Necessarily has to feel that cost-cutting method or that cheapness. And the way that you make it, I don't want to say less obvious, but the way that you make it feel less jarring that you're cutting corners is you make the corner cutting a part of the actual comedy or story. Case in point, one of the greatest comedies of all time, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, there's an ongoing joke throughout the movie wherein King Arthur and his knights ride on horseback, but only in theory. In reality, they hop walk while banging coconuts together to simulate the sound of horse trotting, a technique formulated in the early days of Foley effects for radio and theater. You're using coconuts. What? You've got two empty halves of coconut and you're banging them together. So? The joke was the result of the Pythons realizing that they didn't have the money to afford horses Dismount. or, for that matter, riding lessons. So what do you do? You incorporate it. You make it a part of the thing. And in Uata and in Cuff, which we'll see now, the, the backgrounds are part of the story, in a sense. Some of the cartoons are set in the real world, so the backgrounds being real aren't just a cost-cutting method. Like the coconuts, they've been made necessary Hence, their true, less artistic reasons for being are now less obvious. For more on this cartoon, if you want to watch my commentary of it, click right up there. Uh, anyway, let's uh, let's see. Oh, another great uh, performer that uh, Warner, Bro Warner Brothers cartoonists were often making good use of is an actress named uh, Sarah Berner, who in this cartoon plays a spider who is also a spinster, a joke that frankly didn't play to me until I was well into my 30s. Um, in fact, she's playing Old Mother Hubbard, the literal mother of all spinsters in pop culture, in the cartoon that we're playing right after this one. Same year, a cartoon called Phony Fables. So, here they both are now. Enjoy. I'll tell you the story of the moth and his flame, but promise that you'll try to keep it quiet. The lady was a honeybee with marriage as her aim, and he lived on a fabricated diet. Now the moth told the bee, come on, honey, marry me, so tomorrow wedding bells will surely ring. Ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, ding, and today's the day that wedding bells will ring. In a suit of fancy clothes, we find our boyfriend in a doze. Twas a zoot suit with a neat pleat nicely stitched. Get up, you lazy creature. Eat your breakfast, find a preacher. Cause at three o'clock today, you're getting hitched. Straight as a broom All dirtied up with Dancing perfume 
time is on the clock. There sat the bride, but she cried and cried and cried. Oh, where, oh, where has her little moth gone? Oh, where, oh, where can he be? Oh, my gosh, it's half past three. So our little pal, the moth, who was fed up with a cloth, decided he was late and how he ran. Ah, but a big black widow spider dropped beside him with a bang. And with hungry eyes, she cackled. Look, I'm there. was a man she couldn't tame. I don't want to set the world on fire, but it says the moth's attracted by a flame. And they settled in the vest and lived happy ever after on the cuff. But you know, folks, I never could understand what that cute little bee could see in that silly moth. Mm, what a dope. Mm. Oh, yeah! a child again, just for tonight. And between these covers, we find these immortal favorites. Sleeping Beauty. Remember the lovely princess who was bewitched into a deep slumber until her Prince Charming came to break the spell? Wake up, wake up! You 
you lazy good for nothing? Come on, wake up! Tom Thumb. The little boy who got his name because he was no bigger than a man's thumb. Let's pay this interesting family a visit. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. Thumb. Where's little Tom? Are you Tom Thumb? Uh, 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 yeah, uh, that's me. Uh, why, I thought you were no bigger than a man's thumb. How did you get so big? Uh, vitamin B1. <laughs> the grasshopper and the ant. The story of the industrious little ant and the lazy grasshopper. You're gonna be sorry. I've worked all summer and put away plenty for the winter. But you, you lazy thing, you're gonna starve. The bad boy of the fairy tales. The boy who cried wolf. Wolf! Wolf! Help! Help the wolf! Wolf! Help! Help! Wolf! 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 <laughs> what a joy. <laughs> what a dope. There's a lad who could stand some discipline. What a dope. You'll learn his lesson someday. <laughs> Jack and the Beanstalk. The story of the boy who climbed a beanstalk, only to be met at the top by a ferocious two-headed giant who forced Jack to run for his life. <laughs> had it. Why did you quit? Uh, he's been sick. The wolf in sheep's clothing, the fifth columnist of his day. By means of a disguise, he preyed upon unsuspecting little sheep. Bah! 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 working this side of the pasture. The Arabian Nights gave us the story of Aladdin and his wonderful lamp. All Aladdin had to do was to rub the lamp and presto, the genie appeared. I dream of genie with the light brown hair. Nasty kid again. <laughs> what a joke. <laughs> what a joy. <laughs> hey, young fella. You're going to yell wolf once too often. Hey, go on, go on. Mind your own business. Mind your own business. Can a guy have a little fun? A session in the woodshed wouldn't do that boy any harm. And here's a bird you wouldn't mind having in your own home. A goose that lays golden eggs. Hey, wait a minute. You're supposed to lay golden eggs. 
Not anymore, brother. I'm doing my bit for national defense. Old Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard to get her poor dog a bone. Remember this little nursery rhyme? This little piggy went for to market. This little piggy has gone for to stay home. This little piggy has had roast beef and smashed potatoes. And this poor little piggy, he don't have anything, all kinds of things to eat. And this little piggy has for to crying like anything. Wee, wee, wee. All the way. For crying out, Pete's sake, Mother! Be careful! My corn! Cinderella and her glass slipper. A little girl Whoa! who... Whoa! Help! Help, somebody! Help! Uh-uh. Oh. He's at it again. Whoa! Whoa! Help! Help the wolf! What's up, docs and docats? It's Trevor Thompson, the self-appointed Looney Tunes critic here, and this next cartoon may only be popular on the internet because of Eighth Men. I've been looking for good copies of this cartoon for quite some time. In fact, well before I became the Looney Tunes critic. And once, uh, once cartoons started to show up online, I can't tell you the number of times people just reposted the Eighth Man version. Well, now we have a full-on restoration and it looks great. Um, some of these uh, restorations that were made by HBO Max, the color rings and some of the title cards really don't look that great, so I took it upon myself to fix that stuff. And um, so, again, the best version available. And here it is, it's Chuck, one of, it's one of the funniest Chuck Jones cartoons in this era. It's his hilarious one-off cartoon about a fox who misunderstands the meaning and the necessity for a silver fox in Hollywood. Believe me, that's something I can certainly understand. <laughs> it's 1942's now fully restored Fox Pop. business when this program is brought to you each day through the courtesy of the sterling silver fox farm ladies this is the year for foxes yes foxes have really come into their own wherever you see smartly dressed people you'll see foxes this season on fifth avenue on Hollywood Boulevard, yes, and even Miami. The discriminating woman everywhere will insist on having a genuine fox around her neck. Now don't 
forget, ladies, for the best in foxes, go to the Sterling Silver Fox Farm. To, to Mrs. Van Doe. He, he, he said so. Say, are you nuts? Now listen, bub. They're all going out, see? And you're with us. Or... Uh... Oh, uh... Well, uh... I, I'd like to go with you, sure. I, I want to go with you, but, uh... The, the door's locked. I can't get out. No key. No key? Nine o'clock call. Just want to get out of here.
about me? Uh, uh, I'm no silver fox. <laughs> I never was a silver fox. <laughs> Look. <laughs> no silver. <laughs> silver Schmilver. As long as you're a fox. And that's what's biting me. That's what. Yeah! Will I... <laughs> And away, the most popular fellows at, uh... <clears throat> Out and away, the most popular fellows at old P.U. are the three Dover boys. Tom, the fun-loving member of the trio. Dick, a serious lad of 18 summers, plus a winter in Florida, as related in the Dover boys in the Everglades. And uh, Larry, the youngest of the three jerks, uh, uh, brothers. A gay outing at the park has been planned by the merry trio, and they are off to fetch their fiancée, dainty Dora Standpipe, at Miss Cheddar's Female Academy close by. With their usual punctuality, the boys arrive at the pointed hour of three. on their rollicking way. Forced to pass a certain public house, a tavern of unsavory repute, our young friends meet the distressing situation with their usual uncompromising moral fortitude. We know that even now, within this very tavern, Dan Backslide, the former sneak of Rookford Hall, coward, bully, cad, and thief, and arch enemy of the Dover Boys, squanders his misspent life. Hark! The Dover Boys. Dread them. Double dread them. They are escorting Dora Standpipe. Dear rich Dora Standpipe, how I love her! Father's money. Confound those Dover boys! Oh, how I hate them! I hate Tom! I hate Dick! And I hate Larry! They drive me to drink! <laughs> Found them. Con! Found them! But let us draw the curtain on this sordid scene and turn to more pleasant surroundings, where we find our young friends engaged in a spirited game of hide, go, and uh, seek. 20, 25, 30. 35, 40, 45, 50, 55. No, no! In here! No, up here, up here! No, no, over here, over here! Over here, in here! No, no, 
in here. No, in here. Over here. Over here. Over here. Over here. In here. In here. Over here. No, no, here. Over here. No, no. Five hundred and ten. Five hundred and fifteen. Five hundred and. Over here. 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 No, in here. The Dover Boys. Then Dora must be alone and unprotected. A runabout. I'll steal it. No one will ever know. like an alert young scout. And that's just what it is. He'll not fail her, I'll venture. Telegram for the Dover, boys. Mrs. Tom, Dick, and Larry carry away with Tavern Upper Bottleneck, New York. Sirs, quote, Help! Unquote. Signed, Dora. 35 cents collect. Sweet Dora, dear, keep courage up and chin held high. The stalwart sons of OPU are here at hand to do or die. P.O.P.U., P. P. we're all for you. Yay, boom. Unhand her, Dan, backslide. Unhand her, Dan, backslide. Unhand her, Dan, backslide. Hey, we're getting in a rut. Stand up and fight, you coward, bully, cat, and thief. Oh, you haven't been thrashed enough yet, eh? And now it is time to say goodbye. Goodbye.
folks. You know, I reckon a lot of you people out there are sort of wondering about us here on the farm during this war. Well, I want you to know that we're prepared for any emergency. Yes, yeah, sir, sure. just like the city folks. Now, take this farmer here. Why, he's heard and read about them there incendiary bombs. You know what he's done? He's even trained his pet dog to help put out the fires. Here's his dog just about to go into action. He's a full-blooded Spitz. Now take this here cow, for instance. Why, you know she's increased her production and she's now given 5,000 quarts of milk a day. And it seems like a lot of milk, but 5,000 quarts is what she gives. Gives nothing? They come in and take it from me. <laughs> what a performance! Well, look who's here. It's old Tom. You know, old Tom is about the oldest cat in these here parts. Yes, sir. Why, he's been around for the last three wars, and he knows that this one will turn out all right, too. Uh, say now, would you look at that? A teeny little woodpecker. Now, I bet you I know what he's aiming to be when he grows up. I reckon he plans to be a riveter at Lockheed. Ooh, look at the tad's tail. Ooh, did I do? I did a whipping. I did it. You know, we American people always sort of look forward to Thanksgiving. And this year is certainly no exception. This year, Turkey is getting fattened up. Oh. Yes, sir, he's getting lots to eat, and you know what? When he reaches 20 pounds, he'll be ready for the oven. 20 pounds? Oh, oven. <laughs> You know, uh, these turtle eggs, they've been laying around in the sun for quite a spell, and, uh, well, what do you know? Looks like they're getting ready to hatch. I do it at the end. <laughs> well, as I was saying, these little turtles are born with a natural bomb-proof shelter on the backs. Ain't that cute? Come over there. Hey, little feller. What do you think you are? Beep, beep. I'm a jeep. Jeep, jeep. <laughs> beep, beep. <laughs> well, now that we're back on the farm, uh, <laughs> let's sort of peek in on a young fella who's a court in his sweetie. <laughs> Marie, oh, I know. Uh, uh, would you be my, uh, the, uh, would you like, the, the, oh, no, 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 uh, would you be my, uh, the, the, oh, gosh, I wish there was a blackout. Uh-oh, uh, blackout! Oh, boy, oh, oh boy, oh, oh, boy, blackout! Blackout! I just don't know what has come over the caterpillars. Just seem to lay around and look glum. Well, would you look at that little feller. He sure looks happy, don't he? Happy? Of course I'm happy. I just got a rage red. <laughs> Uh, these little fireflies here are gonna stage a practice blackout. Looks like they're set to go. Okay, lights out. Hey there, turtle. You better pull into your shelter. It's a blackout. Nope, I did nothing up. Pull your head in. That's better. Why in the world didn't you want to go into your shell? Well, uh, I'm afraid of the dark. All right, Fireflies. Blackout's over. Hey, you. You on the end. Yes, you. What happened to your light? Hey, who 
Who's the bulb snatcher? Who's the bulb snatcher? Did you ever see a prettier sight than this here mother bird? She is a teaching her little son how to fly. It's very easy, darling. Just flap your wings like this. See? Come on now. Do as mommy did. Ah, Ma. I want to be a dive bomber. I guess about the only living creatures that haven't been affected by the war are the famous swallows of Capistrano. Yes, sir. As you all know, these here birds return to the mission on a certain day each year, and we're here just in time to see them come back. They'll be along any minute now. Telegram for the audience. What does it say? It says here, We are out over the ocean. Can't even get close to land. We can't fly to Capistrano. Past the fourth interceptor command. Signed to Swallows. Now you folks all know how valuable carrier pigeons is in wartime. I do it. <laughs> But them there carrier pigeons, well, now this proud couple is famous around these parts. During the last war, they gave more sons to the service than was ever thought possible. Well, more. We did it before. And, and we, we can, can do it again. again. And we will do it again. again. <laughs> you realize this means war. Now 
from heart, I will press to get you, uh, press to get, press to target, uh, pr- uh, pull a live rabbit, yes. <laughs> Ruta, vuta, zut, and observe, a rabbit, yes. <laughs> <laughs> You are for to ruin my act. Wrong, Doc. I'm gonna help you. Uh, let's see now. Uh, you was trying to press the goochie, uh, pre- press the dance, uh, uh, pr- uh, press the uh, 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 pull a rabbit out of the hat. Regarde. Pretty bonny. of a small boy from the audience. I shall be happy to assist you, sir. I shall now attempt to run razor-sharp swords through the basket. There's nothing for to fear. It's a trick. The swords do not penetrate. No. I did a weapon. I did it. Yeah, 
What's up, docs and docettes? Trevor Thompson, the self-appointed Looney Tunes critic, or as some of my friends call me, good old P.U. <laughs> See, you get that now because of the Dover Boys. And uh, we also got our first Bugs Bunny cartoon of the video, that of uh, Case of the Missing Hair. And uh, doubtlessly, Bugs is the studio's biggest uh, character, but we'll get into that in a second. First of all, let's talk about the Dover Boys. These last three cartoons from 1942 were all directed by Chuck Jones and are all very different stylistically. And two of them starred characters we would never see again. Fox Pop is very self-contained, much like Chuck's most famous standalone short at the studio, that of One Froggy Evening. That cartoon is hilarious, contains a vague parable-like message, but is ultimately starring characters that never get another cartoon. Froggy Evening came almost a decade after Fox Pop, but a cartoon that came right after it, and indeed right after it in our lineup on this video, is a cartoon that is so stylistically different and experimental that Jones never repeated it again. Because he was almost fired over it. And that's not happenstance either. He was almost fired over it because it was so stylistically different and experimental. Exhibitors wrote to studio head Leon Schlesinger asking if he'd gone mad. The humor of the cartoon was pretty fast-paced, but the real jarring difference, especially in 1942, was the staging. Jones himself claimed that Leon Schlesinger wanted to fire him, but couldn't because there was no one available on hand as a suitable replacement. But he found it ironic, Chuck did, that Schlesinger had asked him to stop being so Disney-esque, and yet this cartoon, he presumed, Leon may have seen as being a kind of middle finger to that request because it was so radically different, not just from anything specific, but Disney especially. Yeah, you want me to not be Disney? <laughs> Watch. I got you not Disney right here, buddy. You know, Dover Boys was revolutionary in many ways, as the quick and fast-paced timing of it is still seen today. In fact, Gendy Tartakovsky cited it as the uh, inspiration for the Hotel Transylvania movies, if you've seen those. But specifically... The cartoon introduced a then-revolutionary technique that is now used all the time, that of the smear drawing. The technique itself is pretty simple. For two or three drawings within a quick movement, the forms, whether they be arms, legs, or otherwise inanimate objects, become what appear to be giant paint smears. But those two or three paint smear drawings actually shape the direction in such a subtle, subliminal way that when shown at one-third of a second, it gives a heightened, funny, yet somewhat believable movement that, when done well, elicits laughter every time. Some people have said that smear drawings in a cartoon, or more to the point, excessive smear drawings in a cartoon, are basically an homage to this cartoon, The Dover Boys, and that's simply not true, so much as it is just a technique that started at Warner Brothers and continues on. Besides, if you're going to use smear drawings in an homage to The Dover Boys, you need to be a little more specific. Like here, as we see in the 1994 theatrical short Carrot Blanca, itself an homage to Casablanca, although I don't see Leo White hanging out in the background anywhere. But this drinking scene has hints of the one from Dover Boys, for sure. By the way, the design of that character, Dan Backslide, is actually a caricature of one of Chuck's greatest animators, Ken Harris. In fact, one of Ken's greatest trademarks was speed, so for many years, I thought he was the inventor of the smear drawing, but it turns out after I talked to a bunch of my friends in the animation industry, the inventor of the smear drawing goes to another animator in Jones's unit, Bob Cannon. Pimento University. Pimento U. Good old P.U. The narrator of this cartoon was not Mel Blanc, who many know to be the vast majority of the voices in the main Looney Tunes character stable. But, nonetheless, this man was no stranger to voice jobs, or animation for that matter. His name was John McLeish, and if you only want to talk animation, he was a story developer and researcher on Fantasia, and the narrator of a great many of those funny, goofy cartoons where he learns a craft or a sport. Therefore, with the aid of the chart, we first learn the correct form and mechanics of diving. 
McLeish wrote more than a handful of cartoons at several studios in a span of 15 years. And he's also a dirty, conniving thief. Or bully and cad, if you will. Coward, bully, cad, and thief. So, here's what we do know for sure. John McLeish did the narration job of Dover Boys for Chuck Jones at Warner Brothers in 1942. And then a year later, he's featured in the narration for this cartoon, The Rocky Road to Ruin in, at Columbia in 1943. And it is remarkably similar. I mean, the characters, the attempt at humor is the same, the characters, the names, and of course, your narrator, the humble John McLeish. Even the Ken Harris-esque villain is is the design is ripped off wholesale. Look, see for yourself. And I, I, John McLeish was also a designer and an artist himself. I'm sure he saw what uh, the characters were looking like, and and uh, I'm sure that it looks the same because of him. I mean, that's speculation, but I see you, McLeish. I see you. Oh, and what's this? Who wrote this thing? Why, it's none other than your humble narrator. No, not me. John McLeish. And I know Chuck loved the cartoon, too, as he and his animators went so far as to create Pimento University's football team with themselves in a photo. All those guys there, including Mr. Harris at the end, they were Chuck's master animators for decades after that and in some cases until there and his death. Also, real quick, a word about those last two cartoons that we watched. I'm talking about Wacky Blowout and Case of the Missing Hair. I put them next to each other in the lineup just so I could bring this up. There's a line of dialogue in both of those cartoons that a lot of people think is racist. Yeah, I do. I get a weapon. I do it. This is one of the more annoying aspects of being an actual grown-up who's a fan of things that kids also love. Sometimes you have to deal with the fact that those kids think that if it came out before the Star Wars movies, it's automatically racist. So, and for sure, for sure there was racially insensitive stuff made at this time by the studio, as we've already seen today. So, I'm not going to contradict that, but in this case... The weird speech pattern and talking about getting a whipping, that's not what could have then been referred to as slave speak. It's a reference to a white character from radio portrayed by a white person. So, everybody just put your eyebrows down. Relax. Red Skelton was a popular radio star of the day, and one of, if not his most well-known character, was a baby voice troublemaker known simply as the Mean Widow Kid. And boy, did the cartoonist at Warner's make use of this bit. In fact, just for gits and shiggles, here's a little edit I made of any time one of the Looney Tunes characters channeled the mean little kid, proclaiming that he either woke his widow head or didn't know him very well. He don't know me very well, do he? He don't know me very well, do he? So yeah, when you see bugs and this little insect say that they're going to get a whipping if they do it, they're channeling Red Skelton's mean little kid and not being racist. However, the cartoon that we're going to look at next gets its title from a movie about breaking down the barriers of racial stereotypes, 
The Wabbit Who Came to Supper gets its name from The Man Who Came to Dinner, a movie that... A movie that, as I'm thinking of it now, I realize is not the movie I'm thinking of when I wrote this, which is Guess Who's Coming to Dinner with Sidney Poitier. <laughs> All right, you know what? I'm obviously fried. It's break time. You guys, you guys watch the cartoon. It's a double shot of Bugs and the last two cartoons that we're covering today from 1942, and they both have Wabbit in the title. So that's awesome, right? It's the, uh, the Wabbit Who Came to Supper and the Wacky Wabbit from 1942. Enjoy. you don't get one cent if you harm any animals, especially wabbits. You're free now with the wabbit. Go and womp and frolic in the forest. Oh boy, I'm witch. Okay, fellas, break it up, break it up. Three million dollars. <sighs> Lara angel in the sky. Lara la 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 I'm just an angel in the sky. Please, Mr. Wabbit, go on back to the forest where you belong. Be a nice with the wabbit. Ooh, ouch, ouch. Hey, what are you trying to do? Kill me? Hey, you fracture my skull! I'm gonna call Uncle Louie, that's what I'm gonna do. Operator, operator! Hey, you got a nickel? Hello, operator, operator! Give me walnut tree, tree, tree. Oh, that's you, Mert? How's every little thing? Please, Mr. Wabbit, don't call Uncle Wooey. I won't hurt you again, I promise. Well, okay, but watch your step after this, fat boy. Hey, what do you got to eat around this joint? Eat? Eat? I'll fix this guy. Fate's he'll twig me, huh? 
step right this way. That'll fix him. <laughs> Why the dirty double crossing? Special delivery. Your Uncle Willie has kicked the bucket. You now inherit three million dollars. Inheritance tax, two million defense tax, big tax county, which leaves you owing us one dollar and ninety-eight cents. Please remit. You don't get the dough, Aunt Butterball. No, but I'm gonna get you. Yes. What's up, Docs and Docettes? Trevor Thompson, the self-appointed Looney Tunes critic here, and if you like old cartoons and watching online reviewers dissect them, then you probably said the same thing I did about two years ago. Hey, what the fuck? Mayor, watch your language, you bud. Every Saturday morning, I do a brand new commentary of a Warner Brothers short. All throughout the month, I do video essays examining the history of these cartoons. And now, here's Eric Bowser, the new voice of Bugs Bunny. Yeah, you've been listening to the Looney Tunes critic. Ain't he a stinker? <laughs>
dig and dig and dig and dig, I'll never get enough. I twamp the prairies and the plains, I twudge each weary mile. I'll twamp and twudge and twudge and twamp until I make my pile. Oh, Susanna, don't you cry for me. I'm gonna dig up lots of gold, V for victory. Oh, hello. I'm a wagon, wagon, wubber of the wild and woolly west. Of all the things I haven't got, I white gold the best. Oh, it rained all night, today I wept, the weather is so dry. It was so warm, I froze to death. Susanna, don't you cry. Oh, Susanna, I don't you cry for me. I'm gonna get me lots of gold before victory. Good evening, friends! Hey, there's something awfully screwy going on around here. Well, one of the strangest things, I... Hey, smart boy. That's that schooly rabbit. Oh, well. Plenty of you men wear one of these. That's the last score. I'll get that rabbit. Hey, Doc. Hey, Doc, 
Where are you? Okay, what's up, Docs and Docettes? Trevor Thompson, the self-appointed Lady Chains critic here. Welcome back. We are now entering into the last year on the list, 1943, and that is the year with the most cartoons on this list. And uh, with uh, 1942, a close second for nine. But uh, 43 is the winner with a lucky 13, uh, 13 cartoons, and that's why I'm needlessly going to refer to them as the 43 13. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Cutaways. So, I think we've had enough history and enough backstory. 43 is when the studio that we know and love starts making the characters that we know and love. Your Bugs Bunnies, your Daffy Ducks, your Elmer Fudds. And the Madonna of the Looney Tunes stable, ever changing his appearance, age, and relevance to reflect the times, Porky Pig. So, to celebrate that, I've cultivated these next four cartoons in a specific way. We're getting Bugs, Elmer, Porky, and Daffy in this next segment. And we're starting with a cartoon that stars all of them, Bob Clampett's A Corny Concerto. Now, some people will tell you that the little black duckling isn't Daffy, but also, some people will tell you that we didn't land on the moon, because it's flat. Then we see Daffy go commando and Daffy the commando. Then we're back to Bug Six with falling hair. Then we get Porky in Confusions of a Nutsy Spy, directed by one of Warner Brothers' lesser-known directors, Norm McCabe. And then we're losing all those characters but keeping the war theme, as indeed 43 was wartime, with Norm McCabe's Hop and Go, a cartoon with three characters, none of whom we've ever seen before or since. I should also just add that this version of Norm McCabe's Hop and Go is the best that you're likely to find anywhere, and that's not a brag. I mean, don't get me wrong, I am bragging, but... <laughs> It's, it's not just a brag, it's also the truth. Uh, Hop and Go is a bonus cartoon on this DVD, and uh, there are a few things wrong with it, but the most noticeable thing is the soundtrack of the cartoon. When I say the soundtrack, I'm really specifically only talking about one part in the cartoon. This gag here, where the two bunnies see Claude Hopper and decide to mess with him. Here's how it sounds on the DVD and several TV broadcasts. They are Sucker Sandy, do you see the world's champion? <laughs> Shall we pick him doom a peg or two? Eh? Hi? Now, if you had trouble hearing what those two rabbits said, it's, it's probably because the music suddenly gets really loud for no reason. And uh, the, the official explanation for that is that the, the DVD uses a, quote, quote, unreleased stereo mix, unquote. And quite frankly, I don't have the time to get into the myriad ways in which that doesn't make any sense. Not the least of which is the fact that stereo recording onto magnetic tape was not how they made soundtracks or recorded sound for films, to say nothing of cartoons back in 1943. Instead... I think I'll just tell you what's actually going on here. 
This is, doubtless, the result of a hasty television edit to cover up either a copyright or political correctness issue. I can't be sure of which. When you hear the original soundtrack, which is restored in the version we're about to watch, you'll note the score takes on a, shall we say, Scottish tone, which is inevitable, one would suppose, as the rabbits are depicted as such. Now, I haven't mentioned him before in this video, but the man responsible for most of the scores for these uh, wonderful cartoons is a man named Carl Stalling. And he started with Disney and he worked on Snow White. And uh, that jarring music that you hear in this edit that almost covers up the dialogue entirely, that is not Carl Stalling. Nor is it recorded with a full orchestra, nor is it recorded with room tone. It's probably recorded in a room, but I mean, it, it's production music, or as they called it in the industry, the industry term for it, needle drop. And the only reason anyone would put needle drop music, which is itself costly, on top of existing music that they already have the rights to, is if they don't actually have the rights to it. Sandy, do you see the world's champion? <laughs> Shall we take and doom a peg or two? Eh? Hi? Long before the days of YouTube and the basic understanding of fair use laws, the only content creators were corporations, and they would be in a lot more trouble if hit with a lawsuit, believe it or not. I think someone at Turner commissioned that edit, either worried about getting sued for cultural insensitivity, which is not very likely, or about getting sued for having a traditional Scottish folk theme they maybe didn't have the rights to. Which is more likely. I don't know. I can tell you this much. It's not an accident. The idea that it's an unused stereo mix is just ridiculous. Now, you do hear a weird kind of twinning effect in the character's voice when the change in soundtrack comes up. And it does sound like something that happens on a different bonus cartoon on the same DVD set that of Sniffles Takes a Trip, and I can see people being confused. Before the cartoon was restored recently, um, it was yet another bonus cartoon on this set, and it had that same twinning effect that goes on in the Sniffles cartoon once or twice. In fact, here's the comparisons. <laughs> This is the life. Now, again, there's no stereo mixes in the original cartoons, which is why the restoration of the Sniffles cartoon sounds so great, because they only use the original film negatives in these restorations. But I don't know what's going on in these two examples, but if you've ever played a song on two devices at the same exact time, you know what is happening here, happening here essentially. It's two pieces of the same audio being played simultaneously, doesn't have anything to do with needle drop music coming in out of nowhere and killing the original score. I'm sorry. Anyway, let's look at Bugs, Daffy, Elmer, Porky, and two really great Norm McCabe cartoons, one I painstakingly restored for you all by myself. I, it wasn't painstaking, it was literally just swapping out a little piece of audio. Also, I fixed the intro, that was wrong too. But yes, <laughs> here they are now. I'm back! Music lovers. <laughs> First, we will hear a waltz written by Johann Strauss. <laughs> and as we hear the rhythmic strains of the haunting we flain, listen to the whip wing rhythm of the woodwinds as it rolls a wound and a wound, and it comes out here. <laughs>
Wasn't that lovely? And now we will present the beautiful Blue Danube. <laughs> Ich weiß nicht, 
ሽፍ ተለሰ በደን ማስሽ ነው ይንሳካል the poor what gets uh, the blame while the rich as all the grave now ain't that a blinkin shame put out those lights shoots <laughs> und wann quota schulz may i present you with this little token of our esteem for me danke schön danke schön oh uh, just a little going away present well see you around Mr. Smith. A 
Metal Messerschmitt! <lacht>
Troy Dutt Ego, George. Troy Troy Dutt Ego. Mm, that way. Well, gee, thanks a lot, George. Thanks a lot. What's the matter, Bunny Rabbit? Speak to me. Why don't you say something? I'm only three and a half years old. <laughs> What's up, folks? You're listening to it, the, 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 the Trevor Thompson. It is the, the self-appointed the, the, the Looney Tunes critic. Although, uh, everyone's a critic. The, 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 that's all, folks.
Wake up, everybody. Wake up, everybody. Have you had your tasty toasties this morning? Good for you. And now from... Uh, 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 don't touch that dial. And now for our morning exercises. Open those windows. Take a deep breath. Well, I'm not so sure that you're Porky Pig, either. There's your license. 
Uh, can't you see the, the white line? Uh, uh, where's the fire? Move along or I'll uh, run you in, Bob. You know, I'm uh, re uh, really getting suspicious of uh, that guy. Here, pig, it is one minute to three. Do you see that little bag? Uh, you mean uh, the, uh, that one? Yeah, at exactly three o'clock, that little... Champion? <laughs> Shall we take him down a peg or two? Eh? I? certificate to prove it. See? Shall we give him a chance to really prove it, Sunday? I? Oh, I'm an athlete, all right. I even got athlete's feet. Why, 
I slipped that first time, but not this time. Mm, I guess I'll show them their rabbits. Sort of hard on my metatarsal arches. You know, Claude, you're no such a bad hopper. All you need is uh, coaching. Champion jump. I wonder where I am now. What's up, Docs and Dockets? Trevor Tobbs with the Self Appointed, and also apparently plugging Looney Tunes critic. Paris will have, Paris will have. Um, and uh, we are moving right along, footloose and fancy free, right here in the lovely year 1943, or as I'm calling it for no reason that I can figure out, the 4330. <laughs> yeah, this uh, next cartoon in the 4330. Yeah, it's kind of a jab at Disney, or 
Disney's, as it was then known within the industry. Animation studios in those days, regardless of the name of the studio itself, were known within the industry as, where they were known by animators and people by the name of the man most in charge of that studio. So in other words, if it was MGM, you might say, hey, you working over at Mayer's? And the other guy might say, nah, but I did a stint over at Lance's, not Universal, Walter Lance, the creator of uh, Woody Woodpecker. And uh, then I went over to Warner's by way of Disney's. Not Disney, Disney's, you know. It, it wasn't a brand or a figurehead. It was a name. Disney had established many things by this time in 43. In the case of this cartoon, many attempts at telling the story of the three little pigs, I did that a couple times, as well as marrying such a trivial and youthful tale to something as serious and dramatic as classical music, like in Fantasia. So, here now is Brahms, as seen through the eyes of this classic fairy tale, The Three Little Pigs, it's Frizz Freeling's Pigs in a Polka. to present our interpretation of a familiar fairy tale entitled The Big Bad Wolf and a Tree Little Pigs. Set to the delightful music of Johannes Brahms' Hungarian dances. As the scene opens, we find the Tree Little Pigs building their respective houses.
That was Pigs in a Polka. I'm a pig in a sports coat. And this... And um, I mentioned earlier in the video, much earlier actually, that um, Frank Tashin, the director, how he deserves to be on the, the proverbial Mount Rushmore of Looney Tunes directors, but he's often overlooked. Well, just try and overlook this. One of my favorite Tashlands is uh, Puss and Booty, which is uh, ostensibly a standard cat and bird cartoon, but it's presented as if it was directed by Hitchcock. It's full of really dramatic angles. If you, if you actually shot a live action picture using these as storyboards, it, it would be pretty darn good. I think actually Jones mostly learned a lot from him. People don't think about editing as a component of these cartoons, these Warner Brothers cartoons, but Tashlin understood editing. Oh, porky, porky. He's cutting scenes at an accelerated pace the way a really talented director might. Wasn't that rad? I mean, I'm 42 and just, we grew up, you know, kind of, you know, knowing that Frizz, we knew who Frizz Freeling and, and Chuck Jones were in a, in a vague kind of way. Nobody knew who Frank Tashman was for the longest time, and it's now nice to really see him getting his due, and just, you can see things like that. Um, it's sooner rather than later. Beggars can't be choosers. So here now are three of uh, Tashman's greatest gag cartoons, at least in my opinion, I would say. Uh, three of his greatest gag cartoons, two of which featured Looney Tunes crown jewel characters, that of Porky and Daffy, and all of which are black and whites uh, from this year that we're currently in, 1943, uh, or as I'm call, it's another entry into the, uh, for, it's, for, it's 1943, it's Porky Pig's Feet, Puss and Booty, and Scrap Happy Daffy. Enjoy. $152.50. You will, of course, uh, pay the bill now before you leave, no? Uh, no, no, no. I mean, yes. Um, uh, my partner, Daffy Duck, will be re right back. He's out uh, he, uh, he, uh, cashing a check. Come on, seven. Be good to Daffy. Don't fail me now. Uh oh. Snake eyes. Too bad. You is a dead duck, duck. Don't worry, Daffy will be here in a minute with the money. Well, um, I hope so. Insulting my integrity! Hey, Faxo! Insinuating I flee this flea-bitten duck! Hey, Faxo! Intimating I'd abscond with your financial remuneration! Hey, Faxo! Hey, look! A Dick Tracy character! Prune face! You have insult me! We meet on the field of honor! Your 
coffee racing for this week, Robespierre. You have insulted me. We meet on the field of onion. Here. 
Hello, Centro. Give me Bugs Bunny. Hello, Bugs. This is Daffy. Uh, what's up, Duck? That Palooka manager has got us locked up in the Broken Arms Hotel. We thought you could help us get out. Uh, did you try the elevator? Yes. Uh, throw him down the stairs? Yes. Use the sheets? Yes. Swing across on the rope? Yes. We tried all those ways. Ah! Don't work, do they? That's all, folks. Hey, well, what you got? What's up, folks? You're listening to it to be to be the Trevor Thompson, it is to be the self-appointed it will be the Looney Tunes critic. Although uh, everyone's a critic, it will be it will be that's all, folks.
spoil your seeds and get nice and big. And you too, Rudolph, eat up all your dinner. What's up, docs and docettes? Trevor Thompson, the self-appointed Looney Tunes critic here, and if you like old cartoons and watching online reviewers dissect them, then you probably said the same thing I did about two years ago. Hey, what the fuck? Bear, watch your language, you bud. Every Saturday morning, I do a brand new commentary of a Warner Brothers short. All throughout the month, I do video essays examining the history of these cartoons. And now, here's Eric Bauza, the new voice of Bugs Bunny. You've been listening to the Looney Tunes critic. Ain't he a stinker? <laughs> So 
to victory, let's go. And do the job with junk. Pots, pans, old tin cans, pails, nails, empty gales, hats, hats, rubber mats, missing links, kitchen sinks, garbage cans, electric fans, rubber boots, bathing suits, reels, wheels, run down heels, beds, springs, pips and rings, metal shears, old tin ears. Tires, chains, water mains, skates, plates, furnace rates, pitching forks, rubber cords, sacks, racks, railroad tracks, clothes, holes, fiddle bowls, plugs, gloves, bathroom rugs, cotter keys, housemate keys, rubber bands, birdcage heads, metal slips, pillow slips, locks, locks, grandpa clocks. And that's why we're in to win. Well, how do you like that, sickle groover? <laughs> Uncle Dillingham, Duck. 
Did I cry spinach when I stood a duck on Plymouth Rock? Did I in Washington give up with their limp fortune hawk? Did Dale Gould and me quite quits when Injun saved our scalp? Did John Paul Duck give up the ship or ever holler help? Hey, Daffy, Americans don't give up. No, Daffy, Americans don't give up. That's right. And I'm an American. Duck. Up there in the sky. It's a bird. No, it's a plane. No, it's a bird. A dream. It was all a dream. Yes. Next time you dream, include us out. That's all, folks. Hey, gang. Trevor here. And um, just wanted to ask you all a small question. Have you ever seen The Fifth Column Mouse? Wow. Wow. So, so let me just interrupt you for a second. So, because of all that, all that, that's why you, you didn't get to see the fifth column mouse? Damn. Well, I hope it grows back. Meanwhile, time to play catch up. Here's uh, one of my favorite Frizz Freeling cartoons from the World War II era, and apparently the one that you missed, and my condolences with the... Yeah, you know, anyway, it's Fifth Column Mouse.
And don't be naughty mice Appease him Or he'll get offended He wants to protect us From the ones who wrecked us Please him He wants to protect us uh, That's what I've been saying Gee, that'd be fine uh, Then hurry and sign a truce And go fight up, see? And remember, above all, to add an obituary jibbo, reckon on Fosco, Fanny, Schnipper, and Al on a filigadusha. You got that? Okay. Thank you. 
What's up, docs and docettes? Trevor Thompson, the self-appointed Looney Tunes critic here, and if you like old cartoons and watching online reviewers dissect them, then you probably said the same thing I did about two years ago. Hey, what the fuck? Mayor, watch your language, you bud. Every Saturday morning, I do a brand new commentary of a Warner Brothers short. All throughout the month, I do video essays examining the history of these cartoons. And now, here's Eric Bowser, the new voice of Bugs Bunny. Yeah, you've been listening to the Looney Tunes critic. Ain't he a stinker? <laughs> The poor you, Mr. Duck, but I'm a sportsman. A great, great sportsman. <laughs> a great sportsman, eh? <laughs> sportsman. Listen, sport, you don't know the meaning of fair play. What chance has a poor, helpless, fluffy, little winged creature like me against you? You with your bullets, and your shotgun, and your knife, and your dip call, and your hunting coat, and your hunting dog, and all kind of stuff like that there. What protection have I got? A bulletproof vest, I suppose. <laughs> How did that get there? How would you like to meet me in a fair fight, Mr. Sport? All things being equal, man to man, Marquis of Queensbury rules. Huh? Huh. That's different, eh? Yeah, that's something else again. Yeah, you don't like that, do you, sportsman? No. Yeah. Yeah. You don't like it. Uh. In that corner. <laughs> In that corner. <laughs> He's a dog. <laughs> you can have him. <laughs> what a tramp. <laughs> who needs no introduction. That outstanding exponent of clean sportsmanship, 
the champion of champions, your friend and mine, our own, our beloved Daffy, good to his mother, Duck. Now, boys, fight clean. Oh, brother! No rough stuff. None of this. Or this. Or this. Or like so. Or this. Or this. Or this. You understand? Yeah, you mean uh, none of this? Or this? Or like so? Or this? Or this? Or this? Or this? Huh? How about a little of this? Absolutely, uh-uh. You know, there's something awfully screwy about this fight. Or my name isn't Larimore. And it isn't. You're gonna punch him, champ. He's practically a dead duck already. Now get in there, sight. Go on in there and knock him out. Give it to him, champ. Let him have it, champ. Hmm, getting a little sin on top. How about a little something to stimulate the scalp? Now shake hands. Which hand do you take? Mm, uh, that one. Nope. Wrong. Guess again. All right, all right. I'll take that over there. <laughs> Ain't he a dope? You sure this is the one you want? <laughs> You're right! This is the right one! And here's round one coming up. One, three, nine, ten, you're out! The winner and new champion, Daffy Duck! the one to complain, Mr. Weffery, but I thought you said no woof stuff. Hey. Or this, or this, or like so, or this, or this, or this. That's all, folks. What's up, ducks and duck cats? Trevor Thompson, the self-appointed Looney Tunes critic here, and I'm I feel kind of proud of myself, actually. Uh, this cartoon we just watched, To Duck or Not to Duck. I uh, I recently used this cartoon to great effect in my review of the Bugs' 80th Blu-ray, which is wonderful, as is the Blu-ray. But the scene where the ref explains the rules to Elmer, which Elmer uses to his advantage at the end. No what stuff. None of this. Or this. Or this. Or like so. Oh. So, to make the point, I use this cartoon to make the point that we love the Blu-ray and we'll, we will buy it, and you don't have to doll it up with ugly fake collectibles to do so. We will buy it. So, I did this. Or rather, I did it! No rough stuff. None of this. Or this. Or this. Or like so! Or this! <laughs> and definitely none of this! See? That's the kind of fun we have here at Ferris Wheelhouse. So if you haven't yet, do us a favor and subscribe. And um, as we talk about the last Bugs Bunny cartoon, the last Bugs Bunny cartoon on this list, buddy. Can you believe it? It's a Chuck Jones fan favorite, Whack Kicky Wabbit. As great as this cartoon is, and as great as many of Chuck's cartoons are, this one, like Dover Boys, is not typical of the regular Jones fare. To say nothing of those crazy backgrounds by the Fleurys, a married couple named Bernice Polifka and Eugene Fleury. They're not widely remembered as being Chuck's usual background artist, but as you see here, it's not by virtue of a lack of artistry, creativity, or ability. But the other thing this cartoon does that very few of Bugs' cartoons do is pit him against two of his writers. 
Oh, sure, there's a few examples one could cite where Bugs literally goes after his fathers, but in this case, the writers enter the frame not as themselves, but actual characters. Granted, characters that sound and look like them, but they are indeed characters. And hungry ones at that. Two of Jones's most frequent gag men throughout their tenure at Warners, Ted Pierce and Mike Maltese, are the two stowaways in this cartoon, providing not just the look of the characters, but also their own voices. Now, both of these Jokers have had some time in these cartoons as characters, most visibly in the case of Maltese. He's featured as the security guard in You Ought to Be in Pictures, but even though, and as we see in Wacky Key and a few other cartoons, he is capable of doing a funny vocal performance. Oh, me see. Snow too cold in winter. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Uh -huh. However, that's not Maltese, but Mel Blanc providing the speaking voice of the guard. Ted Pierce, on the other hand, has a lot more experience than Maltese as a voice actor. We've heard him before today in the Dover Boys. Unhand her, Dan Backslide. Unhand her, Dan Backslide. Unhand her, Dan Backslide. Hey, we're getting in a rut. And heard his great Bud Abbott impression. What's the matter, Freddy Cat? This is only a tiny little bird. And now we're about to hear him as the tall stowaway. It's Pierce and Maltese, starring opposite that Waskwee Wabbit in the Chuck Jones classic and sadly the last Bugs Bunny cartoon on our list. It's 1943's Whack Kicky Wabbit. Did you say that? 
Darn if I hope the bar, I wanted a Dito here away. You had to be a Dito here, and not Tom out of here away. Told him an artist, told him an artist, told him an artist, told him an artist, told him an to exist. in order to exist. So...
as we were saying, cats hate... Uh, <coughs> cats love water. And goldfish hate cats. What's up, docs and docettes? Trevor Thompson, the self-appointed Looney Tunes critic here, and if you like old cartoons and watching online reviewers dissect them, then you probably said the same thing I did about two years ago. Hey, what the fuck? Mayor, watch your language, you bud. Every Saturday morning, I do a brand new commentary of a Warner Brothers short. All throughout the month, I do video essays examining the history of these cartoons. And now, here's Eric Bowser, the new voice of Bugs Bunny. <laughs> You've been listening to the Looney Tunes critic. Ain't he a stinker? <laughs> When I learn a secret, boy, I zipper up my lip. Now, the military secret that I carry in my brain, I keep in safe deposit with a padlock and chain. You bet I got a secret. Oh, and I bet we find it out. The soldier's got a secret, but I bet we find it out. Hello, Ma. I got a secret. I can only drop a tip. Don't breathe a word to no one, but I'm going on a trip. Shh, don't breathe a word to no one, but he's going on a trip. Hey, give me some magazines to read for when I'm on the ship. Don't breathe a word to no one, but he's going to go by ship. It's a sense to keep a secret if a fella just takes care. He's sailing on a troop ship, now we got to find out where. I'm a sound and silent soldier, just as steady as a rock. Here's to my little secret, with its chain and padlock. Hello, baby. Hiya, Fussy. So you're a lefty trick. Hope I'll meet some babes in Africa, as kid as you are. <laughs> Ruh, ruh, ruh. 
be a better hurry. I just got there today, ten minutes to catch my plane. Hold everything, Faso! But I've got a, a, a very important appointment. I'll say you have. My card. Yes, sir. Daffy Duck. Personal representative of the most sensational discovery since the Sweater Girl. He's colossal. Stupendous. One might even go so far as to say he's mediocre. I give you that paragon of pep and personality, Sleepy Lagoon. gives him a four-bar vamp, and the kid gives it to him like this. I'm just wild about Harry, and Harry's wild about me. Now the heavenly blisses of his kisses fills me with ecstasy. That's just a rough idea, you understand. He's the sweetest chocolate candy, and just like honey from a bee. Oh, I'm just wild about Harry, and he's just wild about Ken. I do without he is from the south. Can't you hear me shout? Talking with my mouth, could you ever tell? He's just wild about me. The kid finishes mid thunderous applause. Hooray! Hey! He takes a bow. They're screaming for an encore. Encore! Give us more! We want more! Let's have more! Give us some more! Give us some more! Ah, but does the kid give him another song? No, he makes with a banjo solo, like so. Just a minute, Chubby. You ain't seen half of the kid's repertory. The kid does that you like. Woohoo! Go, chicka boom, chicka boom, woohoo! Go, chicka boom, chicka boom! When, uh, sweetie down the real station arrow, she makes up the caballero with something he can't resist. When she kisses, he makes his legs and with the dish of capastrano and a bunch of fighters' fists. When she loves him, make him moon above. Uh, she is a one hot tamale who can love him goodbye, golly, in September and November. Not to mention cold December in the springtime in the summer or when autumn leaves are falling. She will love him. Abum, shaka bum, shaka bum, shaka bum, la la, la 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 la. Woo! Even though you're already made for living, laugh, Clara, laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a cowboy, yes sir I am. Yes sir I am a cowboy, yes sir I am. I'm a cowboy, yes sir I am. Yes sir I am a cowboy. <laughs> Or the land and the sea are ready to fly anywhere the duty calls, ready to fight to be free. You're just an angel in disguise. Who wanted out from up above? Over hill and over day, we're always on the dusty trail. Hunting fox and hunting quail. Oh, I am a hunting fool. Giddy up, giddy up, giddy up. My heart's a nigher of the finest breed. Giddy up, giddy up, giddy up. Just like the wind, I ride my sword to thee. Sure of foot, sure of vibe. Feeling onions makes me cry. This makes no sense. So do I. So don't you go and beat me, daddy, to the nearest bar. Yeah! And now the kid goes into a finale. And what a finale! Stop it! Stop it! 
it! Stop it! All right, uh, uh, let's see what the kid can do. Okay, Sleepy, do your stuff! Let's bring time blossoms bloom again in the garden. So, learned something very interesting about Mel Blanc's performance of Daffy in that last cartoon. Check it out. To kind of show that in the later cartoons, the pitching uh, amount was um, was uh, three semitones. Uh, I used it on for Daffy and uh, Porky. I, I went back and forth from with uh, Daffy and Porky's lines at that reading, and also here uh, you'll see Pork. Or I'm sorry, I, Sylvester is um, pitched up three semitones, and then talking to Daffy, who's at the normal speed. And this is basically just to show you. Um, that indeed three semitones was the, uh, the pitch used at this time. The wedding must take place tonight, my lord. The Scarlet Pumpernickel is about masquerading as a gentleman. And who might you be? Era, may have perchance, hobbish that I am, I might be the Scarlet Pumpernickel? You, the Scarlet Pumpernickel? <laughs> <laughs> so um there you go uh three semitones is the the actual number so um i believe that this is what i found is that porky is at three semitones um so what we're gonna do to find out if that's true is we're going to go to this, what I have saved here is three blank semitones and negative three blank semitones, meaning if I want to make something, uh, speed something up uh, the way uh, blank did, um, or if not, you know, as they did uh, in those days, uh, I go up three blank semitones or three semitones. But if I want to bring it down, I go to negative. Um, so here we are bringing this down. This is Porky. Uh, both of Porky's lines will be brought down and I think we will find uh, that this is what Mel actually sounded like. I need to be a better hurry. I just got to, to, to 10 minutes to catch my plane. Hold everything, Sasso. This is your lucky day. Opportunity is nothing. But I've got a, a very important appointment. Yeah. Um, if you if you listen to uh, uh, Mel Blanks, uh, you know, he did some radio appearances as Porky. And, uh, yeah, I, I can confirm in the 40s when he was in his 20s, um, late 20s, I believe, or maybe early 30s even, who knows. But uh, he, he, he sounded like this. I need to be a better hurry. I just got to, to 10 minutes to catch my plane. Um, but uh, if we do the same thing to Daffy, Daffy's uh, piece of dialogue here, we will find that it is still kind of high-pitched. So let me, uh, let me just do that back and forth here with, with Daffy. I need to be a better hurry. I just got to, to, to 10 minutes to catch my plane. Hold everything, Fesso. This is your lucky day. Opportunity is nothing. See, it, uh, you know, if you to, that doesn't sound anything like Sylvester did in those days. It sounded a little more high-pitched. So what we do is um, I'm going to undo that stretch and pitch, and I'm going to go uh, into that, and I'm going to change it from negative 3 to negative five which would mean that he was uh he was pitched up five semitones 
when they did this. So let's let's hear what uh, what what Daffy sounds like now. Hold everything, Fesso. This is your lucky day. Opportunity is knocking. See what I mean? That sounds a lot more like Mel did in those in those days. It sounds more like uh, Sylvester, to be quite frank. Um, so let's uh, let's do that again. Do the same application, and now let's hear what Mel sounded like in in the uh, in 1943 or whenever this cartoon was done uh, when he made those original recordings as Porky and Daffy. I had to do a better hurry. I just got to do ten minutes to catch my plane. Hold everything, Fesso. This is your lucky day. Opportunity is knocking. But I've got a very important appointment. I'll say you have my card. Yes, sir, Daffy Duck, personal representative of the most sensational discovery since the Sweater Girl. He's colossal, stupendous, one might even go so far as to say he's mediocre. And that is precisely what I do, Docs and Docettes. I'm Trevor Thompson, the self-appointed Looney Tunes critic. We do it all, man. Reviews, commentaries, interviews, fan servicey stuff. If you love Looney Tunes and you don't want to, and you don't want to just watch Looney Tunes, if you want to get in depth about them, learn all sorts of good stuff, please subscribe. Well, folks, it's been a long haul, but uh, I'm really glad you guys stuck around. Um, these cartoons are very important to me. Uh, they're they're within the zeitgeist of our pop culture, but uh, I've taken it a little bit too far, I guess you could say. I just wish that uh, everybody could. Um, see them for the tiny little masterpieces that I consider them to be, and could understand the brevity of how well-made these cartoons were. That is, if they can stop laughing long enough to appreciate them. Well, that's going to do it for this video, folks. Once again, I'm Trevor Thompson, the self-appointed Looney Tunes critic. And until next time... And don't think it hasn't been a little slice of heaven, because it hasn't. That's all, folks. 